Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 181, The Importance of Scale, Determining and Altering Size. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into The Take Up. Glad to have you here on this Education Friday, as we often are. Uh, happy to have you guys here and present for something that is constantly with us, an evergreen topic in the world of embroidery, and that is the importance of scale or size. So the importance of scale. Uh, why are we going to talk about the importance of scaling or size in our embroidery designs? Uh, honestly, because it is one of the most important things we have is the measurement is the understanding of size. Why? And put short, <laughs> put as succinctly as I can before I go on to go, go long as I often do to discuss this is because we are dealing with a physical medium that has limitations that are based on scale and we are dealing with a medium that based on the scale, the size of the finished piece, we may make very different choices as digitizers and also as embroiderers to a degree. We'll talk about that as well uh, as to how we're going to interpret art. How I take the same piece of art from a left chest to a collar tip to a hat front to a full back or a chest front, all of those different sizes and scales are going to require me to make different choices, especially when we're at the very smallest end and the very largest end of these scales. We're going to make very different choices as to how we use stitches, how we fill spaces, and how we break up shapes. So scale is paramount in dealing with these things, uh, particularly when we're talking about text. I know you're we talking about text last week. We'll be talking about text every week. Why? Because text and personalization is the foundation of embroidery uh, as we know it. So in talking about scale, we're going to just discuss some of the things that I think are important. We're going to, this is going to be probably a fairly short show. I say that in all, often with famous last words, but we're going to talk about that for a little bit and say why I think it's important, what we can do to set ourselves up for the best uh, usage of scale and why we should be thinking about it. And we're just going to have a general discussion about things like resizing. I'm going to debunk some resizing myths and just discuss some of the things that happen when we're resizing stock designs because scale is uh, more than just thinking about size, we have the setup. There's the setup and the calibration portion of scale. There's the editing, the resizing portion of scale. And then to a degree, there's the portion of scale that has to do with um, aesthetics and not only uh, art interpretation, but the scale in relation to the, the, the client's garment, the client's desires for who's going to see something. Uh, how far it's being viewed, like how far apart are the person who's viewing the piece and the piece itself. These things all play into the size we should make something as far as interpretation. And then the rest of it's all technical. Uh, we're talking about things like we talked about last week, the smallest usable text. These are all based in these scales that we have to deal with. The physicality of embroidery, of thread, of needles, the physicality of fabric, the texture, the weave, the knit, and then, of course, the reality of making those things work with the kind of art that's in front of us and with the, like I say, usually the environment in which that is going to be viewed. What, Where is this garment going to live? How is it going to work? What are we going to do with it? And so we're going to talk about a lot of that. And as we can see, I threw some couple of examples up on the thumbnail. We've got the sizing of text and how we are changing our stitch types and our execution through text. We have just uh, dealing with single line artwork and how we have to think about that at scale. I've got a very small piece in the background and the differences between a jacket back and a left chest and also how we have to handle uh, stitches differently depending on what job they're supposed to do. All these things are related to scale. But before we go too much further on, I'm going to go ahead and say hi to the folks who are watching live. We have a lot of folks I know had to run and take off. We got lots of people who are usually in the live squad who had to head out. But even if you are in the replay squad, I would love for you to leave comments uh, to ask questions. Uh, it's been a very hectic time in my life lately. If you guys know, you know. Uh, suffice it to say, I haven't been able to answer as many questions or emails as I would usually do, but I am continuing to answer them as I get chances to do so and steal away the time. So please do get on there, comment, ask for things. Uh, good friend of the show, Ramona McKee, already sent in her desired people for interviews, and I'm going to be reaching out to some of those folks. Uh, to get them on because we are going to start our interview series here pretty soon too and add interviews to the pot. But for today, we're going to make this a fairly simple discussion of a technical uh, nature about scaling and resizing. So hopefully some of that will be useful to you, especially I know lots of people ask repeatedly, what do we do about scaling designs? 
that's a big thing. I understand that. But here's the thing. When we're talking about scale, I'm going to talk a little bit about setup and calibration for your uh, software quickly because having that understanding measurement and measuring measuring tools within your software uh, and setting up a proper scale and working at scale, working with a knowledge of the size of the actual piece you're working on is so critical, both for uh, creating designs that, that function well uh, and creating artistic designs and then doing design analysis from somebody else's designs. All of these things are greatly helped by understanding scale and measurements. And it's why I always tell you guys, like I have uh, measuring magnifiers next to me at all times. I'm not lying. We've got that a, a lovely piece that was, uh, I got an upgrade from uh, Brian from Brilliance who gave me a, a lighted version of my old uh, jeweler's loop I used to carry around. Uh, and I have rulers within, uh, within my grasp at all times because even uh, working on pieces that are at a macro scale, I'm still going to be checking on uh, sizes and looking at how things break down. Also, all the things we deal with with distortion, pull compensation, push compensation, uh, any manner of shape distortion, all of these are helped by measurement. The way we fix them is by measuring the deviation between the uh, actual design in thread and the design in the software. Understanding scale is how we get that working. So here's the deal. I understand some of this stuff sounds boring. I understand looking at how we measure on screen can seem a little dull. If you want to make the most awesome embroidery you've ever seen, you want to do specialty techniques, you want to make your own stitch types, you want to make something crazy and have it work, you want to stretch stitches beyond their usual limit, understanding the way they behave at size and then knowing what you're trying to achieve, scale is super important and will help you get there. So, you know, sometimes we got to have that boring foundational stuff to get to the good stuff, to get to the fun. Anyway, let's go ahead and say hi to a few people before I get on to the rest of the show. Uh, we got uh, Jab Embroidery in. Been loving your content, guys. Love seeing you there. And thank you for sharing. It was super super cool to see you guys sharing uh, our time getting to meet in Long Beach. Love that. So let's go. Let's do this thing. If you guys have questions about scale or size or anything, uh, drop them in the comments. And uh, happy Friday, says Jab. Uh, really looking at this forward topic, Eric. Useful in all phases, especially while handling new customers' logos. Since no logos are never created with embroidery in mind. Absolutely. Uh, this is another thing. When we pull a logo into our software, if we have scale established and if we have grid lines established, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, it means we can immediately see whether or not something's going to work and start to remedy those problems. So love that. Cindy had to jump out. So Cindy came from Texas. Thank you for being here. And also catch us on the uh, catch us on the replay. Good luck to you dealing with helping people in the print. Uh, I know I've, I've spent plenty of time in the print side of this business as well, though I'm definitely embroiderer first. But uh, yeah, no, no, no love for having to be here in the dirty part of that business. I always made that joke. The printers and, and we in the embroidery department, uh, sometimes the printers would look at us and be like, oh, you guys in embroidery who uh, are in that much more climate controlled room who are, you know, you're making doilies back there. And we'd be like, oh, well, you guys out in the screen print department getting ink all over yourselves. You guys have a dirty job. But we all love each other. We just like to uh, occasionally huck tape balls around at each other and and make fun of each other in the building. It's a it's a good natured ribbing if you if you know. All right, Frank's in from the UK. Thank you for being here, Frank. Good evening to everybody who is on that side of the pond, and thank you for ch checking in from two accounts. I like the extra hit. I agree. Uh, B from B did that design says hi from South Australia. Love you guys from down under. Thank you for showing up. Uh, John says, howdy, Frankie and B. It's nice to see everybody talking together. Uh, Dora says, hello. Carol says, foundational information is fun. You are my kind of viewer, got to tell you. I'm glad to see you guys talking amongst each other. I love you guys talking amongst yourselves. Because honestly, one of the best things we can get out of any of these groups that come together, especially for things like lives, is community. So get into the comments. Talk to each other. Talk to me. Let me know what's going on in your neck of the woods, what you're dealing with with your digitizing, and let's talk about scale. So before we go very much further, I'm just going to, once again, redefine for a second. Why are we talking about the importance of scale? Well, because scale is important to the way things turn out. We have limitations in embroidery. You know and we've talked about this previously. I'll even pull it up on screen if I can grab that while we're chatting. Uh, the basic size for text for 40 weight thread, What? why we have a safe size, right? Standard 40 weight thread, safe text must be right around four, uh, five millimeters uh, at its smallest letter. So I'm gonna pull that up so we can talk about that while we're here, right? Why not? Let's pull this up in the background. It doesn't have to be huge because we're gonna have this sitting up while we're talking. Uh, but here's the thing. 
thinnest reliable 40 weight satin stitch thread is one millimeter. Why do I say this, right? Why am I telling you this? And why do I, I say it for, fairly confidently? Um, it's not because you can't make a smaller uh, satin stitch than that. You can. This is a sizing where if you use the kind of industry standard size material, so 40 weight thread, uh, 7511 needle is pretty common. I often use about an RG point on most things. I don't always go straight to a full sharp or to a full ballpoint unless I'm working on something that really dictates that, like knit that absolutely cannot have anything sharp. I might not use an R RG, even though that's kind of a transitional point leading toward the sharp side. Um, but we use a 7511 needle. Uh, we're talking about of the fixed width of the blade of the needle. So we're looking at a needle. We've got a fixed width of that needle. It's not going to change. These are some things we're going to talk about. We have some absolutely fixed sizes, right? So our scale is relative to these fixed items, to these to the medium. The needle is fixed. The width of the needle is fixed. When we make a movement with the needle, we know a stitch is a movement from point to point. Well, let's say we're going to, you know, we're dropping our needle and we're dropping our needle from point to point. Well, what does that mean? I'm going to make an insertion here. I'm going to drop that needle in. And if I don't move far enough over when I drop back in again, the chances are I've dropped that needle into the same hole or close to it. Two things that can happen when I do that is the uh, we can lose the loop. The loop can go right through and we can create a knot or we can start bird nesting depending on how many times we do that. Or um, I can, depending if I'm doing a lot of that in a little circle, I make an eyelet out of the insides of my uh, lowercase e's or my o's because I'm getting too close together and there's no room for fabric inside of that to survive. The threads of the fabric will be moved out of the way and I've pulled a hole in it. Sometimes people do this intentionally, often unintentionally with small text. Um, I can also just have that needle drop into texture. Let's say that I'm working with fabric texture. We talked about that too. And I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate this, a fabric texture that has, let's say a basket weave that has small uh, holes in the basket weave that are running around a millimeter. Well, if I drop a stitch, that's exactly one millimeter or a little less than that millimeter. And my texture, let's say that basket weave has 1.2 millimeter holes in it. I might drop that needle in a place where uh, the stitches are falling either in the hole or across the rib, or as I'm traveling with these little bitty stitches, some of them are sinking and some of them are not, depending on the fabric texture. Same thing with ribbed knits. Even jersey knit can be like that t-shirt, uh, where you can have very small columns bridging those ribs in a strange way. That can happen. Um, and certainly with things like uh, knit hats, corduroy, basket weave, polo shirts, uh, even piquets, things that have some texture to them, when we get in the very small sizes, we can have that be part of the interaction that's difficult. And that's not, once again, fixed and fixed to the one garment, but then also variable from garment to garment, meaning we can't just use the same sizes for everything. So we have that. We And like I said, thread, the thickness of our thread is uniform size. We know that if we make one pass of thread, it's round about 0.2 millimeters in thickness. We go back for another pass. It's round about 0.4 millimeters. So we also know as we start building up thread passes, let's say we're doing a uh, straight stitch runs. If we run out and back, we've got our 0.4. We run out and back again on the same line. We do four passes. Now we're getting up to 0.8. We're getting really close to the millimeter we would have had for a satin stitch. We're building up thickness. We also know that when we're building this stuff up, it has to do with density. All density is, is a measurement of space between lines of thread. So once we're drawing with those lines, we need to think about that too. But that's the deal. Why does it matter how far apart those are? And why does that change with different weights of thread? Because it's the space between thread in relation to its thickness, the thickness of the thread and the space between it. And we're talking about how that fills up a space, right? Even if we're talking about going along a satin column, we're filling up the length of that column to achieve coverage, to cover what's behind it with thread. All of these things are highly dependent. I will say this though, when we're talking about scale, yes, we do have these, these uniform sizes, but things do change from garment to garment. They can change certainly from thread to thread massively, but all of it is dependent on understanding scale. And the scale, however, is somewhat relative. So what do I mean when I say that? Scale's relative. Well, I'm showing you this 40 weight satin stitch uh, letter and saying, hey, thinnest reliable satin stitch here is, you know, it's one millimeter. Thinnest, smallest reliable gap is 0.8 to one millimeter. Pretty close. You know, I'm, I'm thinking one to 1.2 on the width. 0.8 to 1 on the gap between them. Can we go smaller? Can you have two satin stitches very close together that still so show a little gap between them? Absolutely. 
Um, the more space we show between them, the more clarity there is to that gap, certainly, or apertures as we have between the two strokes of this E. But if we really want to see it, we want to be, you know, 0.8 mils is a good base to say there's going to be some daylight between those satin stitches. There's going to be some of that fabric behind them, right? So we can see that this makes a stack of five millimeters. The thing is, all of this goes out the window if I change one of the variables. And one of the variables that it does debate on is our, our thread weight. Why do we use 68 thread? To get smaller pieces, well, because it's thinner. If 68 thread is thinner, then the gaps can have to be close together to achieve coverage. And I can have smaller gaps and still have it work. Why? Not just because the 68 thread is thinner, but because it uses a smaller needle. We have to have a 65.9 needle instead of our 75.11. We need to have a smaller needle. So that smaller needle makes a smaller hole. And we can drop two of those needle points closer together. However... What's the thing we need to still think about when we're talking about that is texture. We still have to worry about fabric texture. Not a big deal if we're running on top of another fill stitch that we've laid down because that's going to be a very smooth texture that we can control the angle and grain of. Uh, not going to be a big deal on most hats particularly unless there's really heavy buckram inside that causes needle deflection. Sometimes the support materials inside the hat can cause the needle to deflect back and forth. This is all physicality. And at small sizes, very small text, very small details, little deviations of the needle being moved back and forth around uh, a heavy woven material inside the hat, uh, little deviations in texture. These things can create more visible problems because here's the thing, if we only have, we're down on 68 thread, we're sitting there with a 0.8 millimeter satin stitch column in front of us, real narrow. If there is any deviation of that needle, we're going to get a wiggly column that's very visible. Whereas if I had that same letter that I digitized for a jacket back and it's four inches high and we've got seven millimeter columns, the likelihood of that fabric texture, which generally hasn't changed that much in scale, when we scale up a garment, the texture doesn't become coarser. We use that same fabric, we just use more of it. That texture now, if it moves a, a you know half of a millimeter back and forth on the edge, if it's a seven millimeter uh, satin stitch, it's going to be very much less concerning to you and visible to you than if we've got a very small satin stitch. If the satin stitch is less than a millimeter and you move 0 0.2, 0 0.4, we are now moving half the width of our letter back and forth when we're encountering the texture of the fabric. Whereas if we are encountering that texture on a large letter, there might be a little bit of sawtoothing or roughness to the edge of our satin stitch, but it's not going to be the same kind of percentage of the full width, and it's not going to cause us the same kind of trouble because it's relative. The scaling is relative. Um, so when we talk about these things like safe sizes, when we talk about the size of satin stitches, it's lovely to give you numbers like the five millimeter number here. It's a pretty good number. It's a safe number. There's nothing that's particularly wrong with it. However, like I said, it's relative. It depends on the other parts of this thing. Embroidery is holistic and it all comes together to make things work. And you have to understand the width of your thread, the size of your needle, and you have to understand how the fabric texture is going to involve itself in your process, how that's going to change your reactions uh, and those interactions between everything. So this is part of why we have to think about scale. It's the scale of the design and the scale of the thread of the physicality of this thing coming together, the fabric, the needle, the thread, and the size of the design all relate to each other and end up making the final product. And beyond that, there's also, we can talk about the artistic part of this as well. Um, it's much different to try and fill a very wide area with satin stitches because there's a limit to how long those can be before they are slow, loose, or loopy. Uh, they either run a little slow on the machine, they become very loose, they become loopy, they become very lofty, and they hang off the, of the garment. They're easy to snag. So you might not fill a design. You're not going to have a satin stitch that is two inches long. You're not going to have a machine chunking back and forth, and most machines will not make a stitch that long uh, as they are set up. You know, you have to change setups to make that happen on a lot of machines. Um, honestly, the right call generally is to use some sort of filling stitch, some sort of stepped stitch, as we know, to create that larger size. 
So we know these things are related to the size of the overall design. The thing is, it's all of this together comes to make one scale and one understanding of scale. So scale is more than just size. It's the size of the overall piece, but it's also understanding uh, the thickness of the needle, the thickness of the thread, and what that has to bear on you know the fabric. And also, of course, like I said, the fabric texture. That's why it's relative. That's why it's important. So when we plan when we create, when we digitize, when we use other people's designs, we should do so with an understanding of those interactions, uh, with an understanding of the kind of, like I said, the uniform basic sizes things can be like the five millimeter letter, like the one millimeter column. Uh, these are helpful to us in understanding what we're doing. Plus, if we know physically how these things work, how thin thread and thick that thread works. By the way, this also goes completely out the window with 12 weight Vermilana thread. You're not running a wool blend 12 weight thread the way you run a 40 weight thread. We're going to have to have much larger satin stitches. We're going to have to have much bigger gaps. We're going to have to have much larger spaces between needle drops so that we don't drop this titanic needle through the fabric in the same spot over and over again, causing things like thread breaks and or damage. You can also cause thread breaks by literally just stitching back into the existing stitch you're trying to form before it is formed and splitting it, especially with some big needles and, and thread that doesn't hold up to a lot of abuse which especially threads sometimes don't. So like I said, understanding the uniform size, understanding those things, those are all important. We are going to get into things that I think are, are more useful for not just digitizing concerns and not just understanding these materials. Um, but I think we'll start with stuff that's a little bit more about digitizing and analysis. I think we're going to start with setting up, right? So we're going to start with setting up and calibration. I'll show you that really quickly. But first, let's see if we've got a couple comments here. Uh, other people just saying hi. Happy to see folks here. He's got a Sunrise Tactical is here. Joe Reed is in here. Uh, B has to run, but is going to watch us later. Hey, Replay Squad's always happy to, you know, I'm always happy to have you guys on. So watch this when you can. I do this live when I have the time. You watch it when you have the time. Uh, suffice it to say, we're going to get back into it with uh, setup, right? So I want to talk about setup. I want to talk about calibration really quickly. Uh, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to have a calibrated monitor, and we're going to talk about that briefly, right? Calibrated monitors are incredibly important to me uh, because I think and I will maintain that the best way you can handle uh, digitizing at scale is to know what scale you're at at all times, even if you're zoomed in. And I think that's something that we don't probably talk about enough. So honestly, at the beginning of most of my digitizing classes, you'll see a screen that looks something like this. I'll say, hey, I expect if you're coming into this class and you're digitizing with me, these are the things that I'm going to recommend you do before we do anything else. Uh, number one, use metric measurements. Uh, if you haven't learned it before, if you are somewhere like I am in the US where we have the imperial system still kicking around, uh, uh, one inch is 25.4 millimeters. Learn it, love it, live it. Uh, those millimeters are important. Uh, embroidery points like in density and most density measurements are going to be in millimeters anyway. And when we're working at very small scales, millimeters are easier for us to understand and handle. So I would definitely say learn the metric system, even if you're going to use other systems. I still say, and this is the other thing I'm going to be honest with you about, um, I will still discuss the overall width of a design, the overall size of a design to a customer, especially here in the U.S., if I'm talking about the width of my design, I'm going to tell them three and a half inches. I'm not telling them, you know, 75, 78 millimeters. I'm not telling them that when I'm saying it's three inches wide. Um, I'm telling them three inches because they understand inches very reliably. And when we're talking about like a jacket back size design, I'm like 12, 15 inches at the outset. If I'm talking about big text on a letter jacket, I might discuss that. But I'm not, I'm not going to use millimeters or centimeters there. It, so in all honesty, when somebody says, we don't use that here, totally get you. When you're talking to customers, that's fine. Amongst us, when we're talking about digitizing itself, the technical nature of the thing, as well as measurements of the needle sizes, believe it or not, one of those measurements when you're talking about like 7511, one of those measurements is an old style needle code. The other one is a literal metric measurement of the width of the blade. <laughs> we're talking about how big the blade of, the, of that needle is at its widest point. Uh, we are talking about metric sizes. Thread, generally, yes, we talk about weights or text or anything else. Those are not really thicknesses, even though we kind of understand thickness out of them. Uh, but when we're talking about density measurements, when we're talking about uh, embroidery points, when we're talking about our insets, it's generally going to be metric in most systems by default. So I'm going to say leave behind the 16th and 30 seconds and use metric measurements. Um, secondarily, I always say I want grid lines at one millimeter. This can be achieved a couple different ways. I'm going to show you guys looking at grids real quick. 
I always digitize and edit with a grid visible. I turn it off if I need to for clarity of vision, but that's it. Otherwise, a grid should be on at all times because no matter how you scale, when you're zooming in and out, and I'll show you that in a second, the grid will always be there. And if I know that the space between the lines in this grid are one millimeter spaces, I can very, very quickly judge things like density, width of a satin stitch, the depth of an overlap, things that I might need to know, uh, or pull compensation, push compensation. I can judge those things, things that I might need to know for technical reasons while I'm working. Uh, I like to set them at one millimeter, or if you happen to have like Stitch Artist, uh, which I work in all the time, uh, Stitch Artist actually has subdivided grids. So if you set it to one centimeter, when you're zoomed in and you're digitizing, you're going to get one millimeter subdivisions. Uh, if you don't have that, then just set them to one millimeter. They might look a little crazy if they do have subdivisions, but setting them to one millimeter also makes them super visible if you have problems with the visibility of the subgrids. Because sometimes the subgrids are usually um, lighter in color than the other ones. If you've got some vision issues and the contrast isn't hitting for you, then just set the grid lines to one millimeter. And I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, after that, like I said previously, calibrated monitor calibrate your monitor. There's a calibration routine. I'm going to actually show it to you in both Stitch Artists and Wilcom real quick, since those are the kind of two top people who tend to show up or users of those softwares. But your software should have some variety of this, where we calibrate our monitors by using a quality ruler and the screen to physically set the size of a window or of a measurement line in order to make sure that when we hit the one key or whatever the key is that returns you to a uh, native scale, that what you're looking at on screen is the native scale of the design, is the exact size as close as it can be uh, to what should be coming out of the machine. Why do we do that? Because it stops us from consistently missing the scale and overproducing detail, uh, over inserting detail, using lettering that's too small, using lines that are too small, which is really easy to do in a world where we can zoom in to 6,000% at any given time. And last but not least, I'm going to tell, talk about briefly about the crosshair cursor. No, this isn't necessarily a calibration of scale, but um, crosshair cursors are really great for helping you make good straight lines. So like I said, this is just something I, I think is worth worth talking about. Uh, scale is a big deal. Um, and I, this is actually from a piece about creating glyphs and lettering, which is something we are talking about quite a lot lately. But certainly... This is something I put before all of my all of my setups. Why do I do that before all my digitizing classes? Uh, because honestly, to be on the same boat in the same boat, working at the same time with everybody, the best thing I can think is to be at scale and to understand that scale is important to us. So I'm going to go ahead and actually show you something on that on that scale. I want to show you kind of how this is. We'll go go through a couple of different softwares and just show you what I'm talking about. When we talk about calibration, we're talking about uh, the cursors when I talk about grids and why I think it's so important, right? I kind of made that clear already, but I think it's still worth talking about to understand the process, right? So let's look at it. So let's say we are here in uh, Stitch Artist, which we currently are. I'm sitting here in uh, a Stitch Artist and I'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to back out of here and then go back to uh, Stitch Artist. So here's Stitch Artist level three. You can't usually switch through these, but I have an educator model that lets me switch to all my features. This is my level three Stitch Artist. Um, you can have other levels and all of the stuff, including the basic editing software is going to have this level of calibration. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and pull myself a little further into the screen so that uh, I can give you, you can see the top bar and stuff that I'm working with. The thing is, you're going to have calibration of some kind in almost all softwares. And the thing to do is you look in the utilities, you look in edit, you look in preferences. In some form, in one of your preferences menus should be some way to calibrate. In this case, we're in preferences here in... Uh, in brilliance. And now that you've seen me go to edit preferences, I'm going to bring myself back up a little closer so you can see more of this. We actually have display settings. We have graphic scale and calibration. Um, this is what we're looking for. If we're talking about calibrating our monitor and we're in Stitch Artist, we actually have this slider that we move until this line, as you can see me kind of highlighting, is either two inches long or five cent uh, centimeters if you get the metric box check. So what are you going to do? You're literally going to go to the monitor you use the most you're going to grab yourself a high quality ruler. So not just if you've got something from the dollar store that doesn't seem to match up with any other rulers in the house, uh, don't use that one if you can help it. Get yourself a nice ruler. Uh, it's worth having if you're an embroiderer. And you're going to go ahead and put that up to the screen. And I do indeed mean you're going to lay this up against your screen carefully. And you're going to slide this slider until this line matches that size. Uh, and that's the method that we use in, uh, in the Brilliance platform products to do that. It allows us to handle that scaling and get 
exact sizing. So that, like I said, if I hit the one key on my monitor, I, I'm looking at the design. Let's say I'm zoomed in quite a bit. Number one, you can already see my grids and my subdivisions. But if I hit the one key, I'm immediately going to have my design at size, at scale, uh, that I should expect to actually sew it. So when I'm looking at this piece, that's the scale that it's supposed to sew uh, in the hoop. I'm not having to guess at it. If I were working with something more detailed, uh, like this piece, this is a dogwood flower that was done. And I can go ahead and I'm going to throw this in a different color so we can actually get a, a look at this. It's a little easier to see on screen for us, especially while we're streaming. Um, this is a, a finer piece that's done in an engraving style. If I hit the one key, I'm saying, okay, I'm really getting an idea of the real scale of this thing. And it's got some nice dark shading in it. That's intentional. It should have some dark shading but I can really look at these lines and determine kind of how they're going to turn out. Plus, uh, if you've got it scaled that way, there's the most likelihood that your 3D view is going to be as close to reality as it can be. Truthfully, 3D views are there to kind of give us a general idea of texture more than they are to be perfect uh, arbiters of scale, especially because you realize with a 3D digital view on any software, uh, running the same line twice over itself exactly uh, will not give us double the thickness like it really will in life as thread rolls off itself. But this still means as we zoom in and out, uh, we have something to work from and we can zip out and literally just give ourselves uh, what I call a scale check to say, all right, hey, this really is more of the a smaller size than I thought it was. I was sitting here working on it. I'm working on it at 6,000% and I'm digitizing these pieces and going back and forth and I'm zoomed in on it. And I start to forget myself if I'm not cognizant of that scale. It's very easy then to hit the one key and go, oh, wow, yeah, no, I'm working on a smaller piece. This is what the real size is. Let me go back and then I can, I can zoom in all I want and work tight and I can do all this really fine editing work if I want to. But every once in a while, I'm going to zoom out and go, all right, yeah, you're right. I really need to be paying more attention to, you know, to my scale here and realizing that that's the actual size on screen that I'm trying to run. Plus when we're doing things where we're a little sh shaky about things like the text size or uh, what have you, you can stop and say, all right, that text size does look a little too small. Maybe that logo does need some alteration and I can work through that as it goes. You know, it gives me a chance to have kind of a, a scale involved at all times. Now I'm going to talk about grids as well, but I'll briefly show you guys. Um, if we know, make sure I'm not lying to you. Also have the same kind of calibration. So let's pull this up really quick just to show you. If you're in Wilcom setup menu, you're going to have a calibrate screen option in here. And the way they do it, they do it it's a little different. Um, the calibrating the screen, you're measuring the dimensions of the dialog box with the ruler, uh, the width and the height. So similar thing, but you're just measuring an existing box that's there uh, rather than changing a slider. So like I said, uh, a software is going to have this. Whatever software you have should have this. Yeah, if you are in Stitch Artist, you're going to have that other method where under the preferences, we're going to be able to handle um, graphic scale and we'll have the ability to shrink this up and down. Also, you'll see here a uh, handle size. This is a lovely thing if you got a, a high res <laughs> uh, monitor in front of you. Up the handle sizes, so you can see all the buttons and handles and a uh, Bezier curve handles and things very much easily. Uh, I think it's a, it's a better way to go, much more uh, simply than trying to deal with scales in your software, in, like outside of your software in your operating system. Just zip that handle size up if you need it, uh, especially like I said, if you're working on a high resolution monitor, which I often am. So that's one of the big things you can do. Certainly the other thing I will just kind of recommend, um, decide how you want your mouse wheel to work. Some people like to be able to zoom in and out with their mouse wheels. So they can continually you know, zoom. I'm not a big person with that. I usually use it to scroll, but that's just because of, ma of muscle memory. Uh, certainly, if you wanted to, you can use it for scrolling in and out. Uh, I generally like to use key commands. Why? Because the key commands for me, I'm like one is scaled one to one. I know exactly what that size is supposed to be. And so I generally use key commands for that. Um, you can set that up as a function of your mouse wheel as well, or use any sort of on-screen scaling. Uh, same in multiple softwares, once again. So that's something that you can do. Um, once again, generally, the clicks are going to be a set percentage. Uh, the clicks on your mouse wheel, not all mouse wheels have a really uh, physical click, but it may be different depending on uh, what you're doing. So like I said, uh, you can do it for scale if you like. Generally, I use it for scrolling, but I'm a weird person. That is not usually how people do. Um, that's not generally the way to handle it. But uh, I like it like that, so I leave it like that. That's just me. But let's go ahead and go to the... Uh, the other display settings here, and these are different in every software. Look for your grid values. In this case, I'm just showing you that there is such a thing as the ability to change your grid spacing. Uh, when you were working with uh, in Brilliance, you had the ability to do dots. Generally, I like dotted lines better. Lines are really where it's at for me. 
And in this case, I'm in metric. I've got it at 10 millimeters, but as you're going to see shortly, um, in in brilliance yes i said set it at one millimeter but when we zoom in and hopefully you can see that it's transmitting up on your screen there are these subdivision lines that are one millimeter so can i set those to one millimeter and have the darker lines all the way through yes but then i'll get sub uh subdivision lines as well for that depending on the software um and 0.1 subdivision lines is a little crazy for me um generally if i'm working in other softwares you'll see that i just set them to that one millimeter that does, however, mean that when you're zoomed at scale, sometimes it looks a little crazy and, and a little out of scale. It looks a little too gray. But when you zoom in, these are one millimeter lines, and that helps me to judge. Um, subdivision lines are a little less visible, but are also out of the way and kind of don't gray the whole screen out. So if you've got the ability for subdivision lines, that can help. But here's the thing. Before I even get further into this, we talked about setting up and calibration. Why is that calibration so important? Well, let's just talk about this. We're talking about clarity. If you need clarity between lines, if you're worried about density, these are things you can see immediately while you're working. Let's say you're working on a piece like this that has a lot of these engraving style lines, right? Well, as we're working on this piece, and I don't have the original art in this piece right now. Unfortunately, I didn't grab the original when I was pulling this up. Um, but if we can immediately see as we're working, if you were watching me digitize this thing the first time, I skipped lines out of this piece as I was going through the shading. Why? Because I wanted some places to be lighter and some to be darker. But the cool thing is, as I'm looking through this piece, I can pretty easily start to judge where we're going to have dark coverage, where we're going to not. Uh, how do I know these things? Well, if I'm looking in here and I've got my subdivided lines, you see that I've got these squares that have the one millimeter to a side. Well, if I'm looking through that piece and I can see, all right, we know that one pass of threads about 0.2 mils, two passes about 0.4, three passes that's going to be about 0.6. If I'm seeing about three passes of thread in every millimeter square, every 1.5 millimeters that I'm looking at in length without even doing any measurements on density, I already taught you how to measure it. If you want to measure it, I know that I've got, you know, I'm getting close to coverage on this. I'm getting close to full coverage. I've probably got around 75 to 80% coverage in this area. Why do I know that? Well, I know the size that my thread is. I know that I'm working with 48 thread. And not only do I know what size of the thread is, I know what density means. And I know that if we have 0.4 millimeters between passes, two passes of thread, if that's a 0.4 millimeter measurement uh, from those two, across two passes to the third, I know that that's full coverage for 48 thread. So if I'm looking at this piece and I'm going, all right, you know, we're, we're zoomed in real tight and I'll bring this back up so you can kind of see those subdivisions. If I'm zoomed in real, real tight on these piece, and I can see, I'm like, all right, well, this is about half a millimeter here, or about three quarters of a millimeter. And I got three passes in there. You know, we're getting around that 75% coverage rate. Uh, not only that, if I turn on my, my points on this piece and I wonder, are these stitches getting a little short or a little long? Well, I can kind of see, I'm like, this is two millimeters here. And right here, that's about probably about two millimeters as well. I already know how long the stitches are in this piece. So even if I'm analyzing someone else's design, I can see about how long those are. I start to see what's there and know what's going to happen on the machine without having to put this through stitching. I can understand what's happening because I already know how these things work. Also, if I were working on something that had more, uh, you know, that had lettering in it, if I was working on a logo piece, I can look at this piece and say, all right. I can see that the gaps are a certain size. I can see that the satins are a certain size. Or if I know, wait a minute, this is going on corduroy and that corduroy has these big two millimeter whales on it with a big gap in between. And I've got little bitty satin stitches that are vertical that are on that corduroy that I'm definitely gonna have to support those as something. And I mean, corduroy is an extreme experience, but knit hats or even jersey knit, I can start to look at the measurements of what's there. I can understand what I'm going to encounter uh, both with the thread itself and with the garment. And I don't really have to make a lot of judgments. I don't have to measure that kind of have a good idea density. And if we're looking at this piece, um, I'm actually going to go ahead and zip over to the actual piece. That's what the piece looks like. Uh, and this piece is done. This is a 40 weight thread. This is black polyester thread on a polyester twill. And it's just a fairly normal twill. You can see the, uh, that, that diagonal line that is indicative of that twill pattern for the weave. And as we can see, when we get into those spaces, yeah, right? As I zoom in here, right in that area we were looking at, we've got about 80% coverage. There's a little bit of daylight in there. We can see a little bit. And if we go a little bit further over, we can see that it opens back up. 
Also, I can tell if I want to leave these little florets open inside of this dogwood flower, I know how far apart they need to be. And when I'm digitizing, I'm not measuring all the time to digitize those. If I know that to have a nice open space, I might I want probably 0.8 millimeters to a millimeter inside of there. Even if my art has lines that aren't really conducive to that, I can make alterations to make that work. So let's zoom back in. Let's turn the points off. We'll zoom back in and look at that piece. And when I zoom in, you're going to notice something. Look at those gaps between those lines. What are you going to notice? Where I wanted to have those big open petals. Well, here's my one millimeter subdivision. You can probably see it on screen. So here's what about a millimeter looks like. These are about 0.8 mils. If I go and measure it, which I don't have to, if I zoom in, I hit my M key and measure it. If I go look down at the bottom of that screen and look for that length, you're going to see it's a millimeter or right, over, right about or two mils in this particular case. But you can see I've got this millimeter box that's there. That one's almost two mils. But down at the end or on the smaller florets, pardon me, you see the smaller florets, you're going to have that same kind of measurement. If we measure these lines and we look at, at the gaps, we're going to have 0 0.8, 0 0.9 mils. Nothing's going to be below that if I wanted it to stay open. Here's none of the smaller kind of leaflets. And yeah, they look like, diag di like diagonal lines and diamonds at this size, but we're at this really micro size. We can say 1.2 millimeters. You look at that bottom corner right under my face, you'll see that length says 1.2 mils. I know that's going to stay open even if I run lines all around it. And if we want to go back into that space that we looked at earlier, and we'll zoom right in, we go look at where we started to have some pretty denser coverage over here. Let's go and measure across our three lines, right? Even though these are really close together, that's three lines. We can kind of oh, get a look for that. And I've gotten, I actually went and scrolled where I shouldn't. But we measure across our three lines right here. What are we looking at for our, our density? We hit our measure key. We go right here and our three lines giving us 0.6 mils. Yeah, right? Uh, 0.6 mils. So we're we're looking at instead of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, like one and a half times that spacing. Yeah, we're getting into those densities where we start to see some space between them. And if we're looking at individual areas and we want to see that there's a gap, is there going to be a gap here up toward the top? We get our measurement and between these lines, we have about 0.8 mils. There's probably going to be a gap, though this is a doubled line. We have three lines right together. That's going to build up to be something that's closer to uh, 0.6 millimeters, you know, more than half a millimeter. If we go back and look at that same area in here, we can see we have open spacing that's in here, but over where it starts to get clumpy, we do have lines that come together. And we can kind of see that same density in that open and the opening in space down here in the bottom leaflet. So let's go look at that pedal again. And we'll go look at that pedal uh, in software. Let's zoom out and actually take a look at that. In fact, let's use our navigator. We can kind of get down there. Let's zoom out and uh, we'll take a check at, at what's going on there. We'll zoom back out of this thing here if I can get this to lock in. All right, there we go. Sorry, folks, had it uh, grabbing my attention. One of the other softwares is grabbing that <laughs> cursor. Let's zoom back over here. We can see that we have some spacing in here and you can see that there was some looseness, but especially toward the ends, toward the tips. Why is that? Because we have this kind of chiseling that we're doing as we get in toward the tips. We're kind of bringing it back to these points. So they're staying a little tighter, whereas through the middle, we're more even. So we're actually getting a more even coverage through the middle of that shading. But up at the tips, we have some space. And you'll see there's a larger space that's in here. And once again, if we want to measure this like a density, if we measure like a density, we're looking at 0.6 mils. So we've got a very similar density to that shading on the other side. This is all stuff we can know if we want to. And we can also use our density charts we were using for fills to understand that. And you can see there's a gap that's right here toward the center under the middle of that tip because we've left out a line and left a gap. If we go to the actual piece, you can see the gap right there. These are things we can know, and we can know them very intuitively if we have our scale in mind while we're working. Um, it, when I was looking at the original design, do you think that I drew every single line that was in the original design that this came from? Uh, absolutely not. I left spaces on purpose. I left spaces in this piece so that I would have that kind of looseness. And pardon me, this is actually one of the designs that I, I have on the only stitch. Um, but this piece, I do leave that openness on purpose. Whereas in other areas where it's supposed to be darker up into the curve, I didn't leave as much space. Um, but this is a decision I can make while I'm digitizing. You'll say, all right, I can see you analyzing and measuring while you're going, but what do you, how are you doing that when you're digitizing? Well, very simply, because if I'm digitizing, the same kind of choices are going to happen. And let's say I was doing it entirely manually. I can start making manual you know, decisions to make these manual stitches. And even if I'm making these manual stitches, it's, it's still possible for me to, to kind of judge these things very simply, you know? I'm still kind of judging how far apart these stitches are. And as you can see, if I'm zoomed in,
I'm already looking and saying, all right, those are pretty short. Maybe I want longer stitches. I want about two mil stitches. Okay, well, I've got my two millimeter, uh, two millimeters worth of boxes I can kind of look at. Let's say I know I want about a half millimeter of or less of a return here. Well, I know I can kind of measure that half out by just seeing how close it is to the square that's behind me. If I want to have my density at a certain rate, yes, I can set it ahead of time. But while I'm digitizing, imagine I've got tons and tons of lines behind me. Uh, as I often do when you're working on an engraving style piece of art, it's got more lines than you can really get a hold of because when we're working with scratches on a brass plate, if it really is an engraving style piece of art, um, there's many more little lines to make that density happen uh, in an inked piece than there's going to be in your embroidery piece because of the thickness of our thread. But you can see that I can still kind of master that measurement where I'm like, all right, I'm shading, but I know that I want to be, you know, at least 0.4 mils here because I'm I'm going to start getting kind of like a doubled uh, density. And if we look at this piece without me kind of measuring it, and I may not be all that close, uh, but we look 0.9 millimeters, darn, um, almost right on. I'm at about uh, twice or, or half density, twice the normal spacing. I'm going to have a half density filling in that area. And that's because I've used single stitches. So let's say I want to come back and do that with a double line stitch. I want a thicker line, but I want them further apart. I could do the same thing. I'm going to jump in and say, all right, I want these double line stitches, but then I need a bigger gap. Why? Because these two are going to add up. I'm going to jump about 0.8 millimeters off, and I'm going to jump up here and continue to make my engraving style shading, right? And so you can say, all right, really, you're, you're measuring while you go. I'm not. That's the thing. I'm not really measuring while I go. It seems like I am, but I'm not entirely measuring. Why am I not really measuring while I go? Well, that's the thing. I don't really need to measure entirely if I have this grid behind me and understand what's going on. I know two lines of thread is going to give me that 0.4 um, millimeter thickness. It's going to, or two lines going to be you know, about 0.4. If I have that same density, I know what that density is. I know I need 0.8 between those doubled lines to get some space. And if I know that ahead of time, as I'm working, even if my original art had tons of lines, and I'll draw them out as if they were there. Let's just imagine my original art has tons of little lines. They're everywhere. There's little lines all over the place. I can elect to only use the lines that I need to still get the same look. I can say, all right, well, it goes tall here, but then it gets a little shorter, and then there's a little bit less here, but there's all these different lines in there. I know I don't want full coverage through here. I know that it's not full coverage in the real art when I'm looking at it, even though these pixels are here or the lines are here, especially when we're talking about things like vector art, I can skip lines knowing the density that I'm eventually going to hit. Once again, if I hit my measurement tool on this one and I measure between these, you're going to see that I'm at dead on 0.8 millimeters. How do you develop a sense of scale like that without measuring? Because you're kind of working on a ruler all the time. You're working over the grid. And when you work over the grid all the time, um, not only are you using the grid to measure and you can actually just plan on the grid and kind of see it, I know it's a little harder to see right now. When I've got the digitizing on, you'll see those subdivisions. They're a little light here. Um, but you can then develop a sense for it. Eventually, you'll be looking at this design at scale with your general grid lines there. You'll start digitizing lines or shading, and you'll hit it like I did just there. Um, it wasn't dead, dead perfect, but a couple of them, I'm pretty close to exactly what I'm intending to do. Why? Because I kind of know about how, I know how wide the uh, grid lines are. I know right around how wide the they are diagonally as well, and I've got a measurement to work on. Most certainly, working like this is going to give me a much better idea than working without the grid. And if I'm doing something, I mean, engraving style stuff is really easy to kind of illustrate because it is very quick and easy. Um, the same thing, though, is accountable when you're doing, uh, when we're dealing with uh, satin stitches. Because the other thing you got to say is like, all right, imagine I am making an E and I'm doing it with no art here. If I notice that I'm trying to make this really tiny E, right? And I'm just going to make this real janky thing. I'm not even going to try and hold down any uh, constriction. But let's say I've got the back, back of this E and I notice I'm looking at this thing and I'm drawing right on top of the art and I'm already noticing that my satin stitches are half a millimeter. I'm like, man, this is not going to work. If this is what's being required of me, then we're going to have problems. Like this is not actually gonna, going to set up correctly. Once I get this done, even though I have plenty of height, I've got you know, you know three or four millimeters that I can probably deal with. Maybe I'm just too small. Plus, I'm going to look at this overall size and say, hey, I've got my type text in here and it's just over three millimeters. That's not going to work in satin stitches at 40 weight thread. Can you get a lot closer with 60 weight? But then I got to make sure that I spec that out and that I'm working toward that 60 weight thread file. Because I mean, here's the thing. This looks really reasonable. 
when I'm starting to work on this piece and it looks like I'm going to be able to make that happen, right? You're like, all right, that looks pretty reasonable. And admittedly, with the slowdown from the streaming software, I'm looking a little gimpy on my letter here, but that's okay. Suffice it to say, if I make that into a satin stitch, you're, you're now looking at it going, man, that looks reedy, that looks terrible. And if I zoom to size, oh my gosh, that scale's ridiculous. Three millimeter text is a satin stitch, that's not gonna work. Look at my straight stitches right next to it, that's not gonna work. Not to mention, if I'm looking at this piece and I do, I notice this is like a third of a millimeter or so, or 0 0.4, 0 0.6 actually, more, more, you know, much bigger than that, I guess, on the length, 0 0.5. Um, we're still looking at half millimeter. I'm like, all right, and if I've got, uh, if I've got some kind of underlay set in this one, and this one does not have the correct underlay whatsoever. But let's say I had, let's say I put a contour in here with a with a nice inset in it not that <laughs> sorry folks if i put a contour inside of this piece and i said all right you know i'm on the underlay i go in here and i've got my edge run underlay on this piece and it's set in really deeply so it's more like a center run that seems fine right seems reasonable until i think about the fact that if i run once and then back it's 0.4 millimeters of thickness in my thread if i look at my shortest stitch my shortest stitch is 0.5 millimeters. The chances of me actually having that underlay stay under this mini, mini terrible column are very, very small. This is not going to work. And when we're working at scale, when we understand scale and have our grid behind us, we won't do this. We won't make these mistakes. We'll have to stop and talk to the customer if they give us art that has a little tiny, you know, has our teeny tiny E that lives in here that is not supposed to be there uh, in this format. There, that's something that we're not going to do, right? We're going to talk to them and say, hey, I know this looks this looked reasonable at first when I was building it, but now it's not so good. Now I'm not very happy with how that's working, right? Um, suffice it to say, little tiny scales, things start to break. So let's pull this up to a more reasonable scale. Uh, let's actually make that the, <laughs> the right stitch type and stuff as well. Let's try and bring that back in a way that makes sense. Let's give it some angle lines on here, give it some inclinations. And then we start to look at it and say, all right, this is actually larger than we need it to be, but let's bring this thing down to our, our five millimeter line, except for I've got a broken line here. Suffice it to say, um, if we're working on this piece and it's working correctly and we've got our lines set up the way they should be, you know, we're going to have a much more reasonable execution. We're going to have something that has lines that make sense. I don't know what I'm doing. Like I said, I'm having some slowdowns, but suffice it to say, we're going to have lines that make sense. Uh, when we go ahead and measure these pieces, even our shortest line at that five mil uh, is going to be 0.8 millimeters. We're getting to the point where it might work. And generally on this, we're going to have a couple points of compensation. So if, if we're in here and we're jumping in this thing, we're going to have maybe maybe two points of compensation on it. Uh, that's going to give us our smallest long, uh, satin stitch right about 1 to 1 1.2 millimeters, which is what we're looking at. Then we zoom out and say, all right, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's not crazy, but it, it's a little small, but that's going to stitch. That's going to work. I understand that things work at that size, right? Suffice it to say, um, these things are much better understood at scale. You know, these things are understood at scale. Also things like texture. Why are we having a texture inside of these satin stitches? Why are we splitting these instead of just leaving them uh, as satins? Well, if we're looking at this size and I zoom in, I'm like, all right, if I'm zooming in and I can see my subdivisions on this piece at scale, uh, I can see that's, you know, that's four or five millimeters. We're talking about, we're going over six or seven millimeters in some of these spaces. We can also see we have some auto, uh, some auto shortening in the corner so we don't get tight densities. Of course, we're going to break that up. Why? Because we're getting up into that 10 millimeter line. And depending on how you want things to go, it it's pretty sensible if you didn't want something to get loopy for that to break up. You don't want it to do that. You can certainly turn that off depending on what sort of uh, setup you've got. You can go ahead and say, I don't want that autofill. I want a, I don't want that. I want satin. And we can do that, but then we can do that with an understanding of like, okay, am I going to be okay? Well, I can look over here and say, this is my whole centimeter. I'm getting up pretty wide. That's seven, you know, six, seven mils across that piece. I might want to make different choices about that sizing. All of this is predicated on knowing scale, right? So let me get some comments here. Like I said, depending on what you're working on, um, it, it really does make a difference to have that scale involved and what you can see, depending on what you're working on, it's much more critical, small details, uh, shading, small lettering, very, very much more difficult, uh, not to have your scale set because you need to be able to work on that stuff. You have to have, uh, a certain amount of understanding of that stuff. And honestly, it just defeats the zoom. So let's talk about kind of the other stuff we're we want to discuss real quickly. Yes, it is a big deal to think about that. Um, like I said, calibration is huge because it just keeps us calibrated all the time. I think having a grid that's constantly there is going to help us to understand things. 
But the other thing I want to talk about briefly is resizing, and we'll go ahead and kind of finish up on that. Um, just to discuss the, why resizing isn't uh, as uniform as people sometimes think it is. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and bring that up. I actually have a, a section of, of an editing class I've done before where I was talking about busting resizing myths. I'm going to bring that up and we'll kind of talk about it a little bit in that in that vein. Because the other thing I get from people all the time is, is not the digitizing side of it. Though, honestly, having that grid underneath there, this is going to help us to understand calibrating and knowing what things do at scale is going to help us when we want to resize a design so we can make educated uh, choices about what resizing can achieve and how. But we're going to talk about resizing in general. That's the other thing that, that is a big scale issue. Uh, people want to rescale stock designs. They want to rescale designs they've had digitized for themselves and they don't always understand what the rules are or they've heard kind of the pat answer, which is, oh, you got 15%, you got 20%, 25%, whatever they think that might be. Um, there are reasons people say that. The truth of the matter is it is massively relative. Once again, uh, scale is relative and it's a lot more than size. We have to understand how it relates to our interpretations and the choices that we make. So let's do this. Let's, let's go ahead and pop up some slides. I'm going to actually run you through some, like you guys end up getting kind of like free paid classes when you show up here sometimes or but in beats and pieces, pardon me for going to presentation mode in front of you. Um, but let's go ahead and get this on and talk about it, right? We talk about resizing, and this is a design that I've done previously and shown you guys a Chambers design that I did for a Netflix show. And it's got some engraving style shading that's in it. It's got some other things going on. And we can talk about uh, how these things break down and what happens when you resize. But here's the first thing that I want to tell you. There is no safe percentage to resize a digitized design. So we just showed you, and I talked about that little tiny uh, letter. We talked about how very small letters can look and what can happen. If we have a letter where we had that safe size, we're at that five millimeters. Well, if we're at five millimeters or maybe a little bit smaller, we're at 40 weight thread. We've got a hole that is at 0.8 millimeters. If I scale the whole thing down, even 10%, we might be getting to the point where we're going to drop the needle in the same place and close up a letter or have it tear a hole or have the uh, compensation not work quite right. When our designs are at their smallest already that they can physically go in thread, when the length, you saw that long satin stitch that we were breaking up into an auto split or a tatami, like a turning fill. Um, when we're at the longest lengths that we can run without slowing our machines down or getting a texture that we don't like, any scaling from that point up on the longest lengths, down on the smallest lengths or the smallest gaps can cause something to break down immediately. It doesn't take 25%. It can be 5% and cause things to break down, especially when we're talking about things like uh, things where a machine might filter. Some machines are set up to either filter out or to slow down, sometimes slow down, most times slow down, sometimes filter out uh, stitches that are over a certain length. That length generally is 12.4 to 12.8 millimeters. 12.4 millimeters and above, you're going to have a chance of, a, especially like home style machines, the machines that are not commercial um, are more likely to have a stitch filter built into them that you might have to turn off or say don't engage uh, depending on your machine. I'm not going to say which machines do what. I don't know them all. However, you may have a design where it looks like suddenly in the largest part of a satin stitch in something that's very um, calligraphic where we have or brush style where we suddenly thicken and we have thick and thin lines. And as we get thicker, there's a break, a big break appears in the stitching that wasn't there when you were creating the piece. Sometimes that is a stitch filter kicking in at that 12.4 millimeter range and saying, I'm not stitching those. Those are supposed to be jump stitches. So I'm going to tie off when I hit the first one that's that long. And until we get past stitches that are that long, I'm not going to drop the needle. If you are right at that edge and you go up 1%, 2%, 5%, that can be enough to engage that function. <laughs> so the truth of the matter is there isn't a safe percentage. People tell you these safe percentages because generally if you're buying a stock design and it's not extreme, it doesn't have super big satin stitch lettering in it. It doesn't have super tiny details in it. Uh, if it's a generalized stock design that's done in a fairly cartoony style, the ones we talked about before, the old cartoon or comic book or, or coloring book style of digitizing where it's low detail, thick outlines, uh, big areas of flat color, those can sh those can scale uh, quite a bit, honestly. And honestly, they're fine to go 25% most of the time. But really, there is no safe sizing. The sizing is all relative to the type of stitches that are on there. And also recognize this, 
if we're working on something like a very textured garment and we went up in size with our lettering because we were concerned about um, losing the strokes down into um, the knit or into piquet or into basket weave, and then we start to shrink down even just a little bit, we might get to a kind of a harmonic where our satin stitch width is just thin enough to fall into a rib knit, to fall into a groove, to become pixelated looking because we're going over a mesh. Uh, these things can happen uh, and it can be a small change. Um, stitch processing also only works reliably uh, on satin, standard like satins and fills. So no matter what software you're using, stitch processing can sometimes break down on specialty stitches because it's made to process the most common stitches. If you have weird, uncommon stitches that you've built or uh, motif stitches, things like that, um, they aren't going to be refilled with more motifs because you make something bigger. That's not happening in any of the software uh, as it stands now. You are going to have to redigitize specialty stitching, motif stitching, sketch fills, um, wild embossing most of the time, depending on your software. Uh, stitch processing is not going to handle all that. We have excellent stitch processing. Heck, uh, in brilliance, down to the base level of uh, essentials has incredible stitch processing. You resize it and it does very well with all the standard stitch types. If you do something pretty hinky, you start doing weird um, types of stitching that aren't very common, processor may not, may not catch those. And stuff like crazy motif stitches, some of the specialty stuff I teach, does not resize. It'll scale, but it's not going to fill the area with more of that stitching the way that stitch processing that is working on things like fill stitches or satin stitches can do. So with a stock design, you can't always do that stuff. If somebody's using uh, some sort of specialty motif run or fill, the chances of it adding more motifs is zero. It's not going to do that. It will make the motif bigger, which by the way, if it hasn't changed how many times it's going to stitch across any one of the lines, which it won't, means that as you get larger, that motif, those lines get more sparse. As you get smaller, they get more dense. Same thing with uh, engraving style shading like I just showed you. Even when you're working with a native file or a working file, so the file that's in the software that you're using, you still are susceptible to the smallest stitch you can, you can stitch correctly that's going to be clean and the largest stitch that you can tolerate or run on your machines. No matter what uh, software you're using, if, if you, even if you have the native file, the choices that were made by the digitizer will change depend, depending on the size and they might have changed how they fill the space they might have also changed textural choices. They also may have done manual compensation, very normal to do manual, especially like push compensation, just to stop the, the design short, where we now don't have enough push to get to a border. Or you might have a straight stitch border that's run over two times, but as you blow everything up, it's still running over two times. And it is now becoming thinner in relation to the rest of the design because it's still going to be the same thickness it was at the small size as the blown up size. Straight stitch outlines don't get thicker when you scale a design, even a native design. Now you could on a native design, maybe copy and paste, maybe make it into a triple stitch or a bean stitch or something else, but we're still talking editing. We're not talking scaling now. Now we're editing the design. Um, and that's something where you may or may not want to do that. And like I said, here's one of the examples of that. Um, this is a filtered out stitch. We have this inline serif that's on this R. Uh, in this particular software with the inline serif on the R, it does not in the 3D ver version show any cutting or jumping. Uh, if we look down there though, we're gonna see that those actually have become uh, like dotted lines. When you see those dotted lines there, that means those are now jumps because this was resized and this original letter was meant to be on small placements. This is meant to be a small letter that doesn't have a, a crosswise, you know, a serif. It's got an inline serif that has the same angle as the rest of that satin there. Um, as we got wider, this thing gets wide real quickly. And even though we haven't quite hit the width, that'll cause this front serif, this foot that's on the R to turn into jumps, this really big serif on the back has immediately turned into jumps. So if we, if we rescale this thing, we're going to have issues. Um, this can happen in all kinds of different places. And like I said, thread thickness doesn't change the scale. If we're looking at a piece here, um, the way, and this is done in the digital preview just for clarity. This is the one that was actually in the background of the thumbnail. This piece called The Orchards. And I might bring this up in thread if you want to see it. Uh, the density is supposed to look about like we have in the upper left-hand corner here. Uh, we can kind of see some text there and it looks okay at that size, but we're not trying to, I mean, yes, I, it's pretty impressive that even in the stitch out, you can pretty well read that sign that says Orchards on there. But this is kind of the density and the lines should have a little bit of curvature to them because in the real world, the thread isn't exactly angular like that. 
But if you shrink it down, look at how much more dense these pieces get. Why? Because these are hand-drawn uh, shading lines and branches and things. They're drawn by hand with straight stitch tools and manual stitch tools. Meaning that if we shrink it down, the spacing between those lines gets tighter, which means increased density. That's not what we're trying to do. Density gets increased. Uh, if we go up on this piece, we, shrink, we, we expand it. Now we can kind of see some of the sins of, of jumping and, and connectors, things that were kind of hidden by the original piece. And some of the other areas look really sparse and angular because I would have added more stitches along an angle if I thought I had the length to accommodate more stitches to make that line curved. Because we know we can't actually draw a curved line. We can only draw a line out of small straight stitches. So some of these lines now look very angular and weird, whereas they looked pretty normal, looked pretty good um, when we were looking at those in the actual design. Like they look pretty good at the right size. When we uh, start to see those things, you know, and we don't have that, you know, it doesn't look as good. Now here's the actual piece. I'm going to go ahead and bring it up so you can see it. This is what the actual piece looks like. Yes, that's a dime. Yes, that's at scale. And we can see kind of the overall density, how it should run. The other thing I'm going to let you notice on this, this was run with matte finish thread. Matte finish thread runs a little thin. So this is even maybe a little bit sparse. You could probably go a little bit thicker. You could run this with a standard thread. And yeah, at that being the size of a dime, even this is massively zoomed in. I should really zoom this further out and make it look like that's a dime on screen for you guys. But depending on how you're watching that, it might be different. But you can see how uh, the design, these look fairly rounded. There's, slight, there's a slight jitter to how these were placed manually so that the lines look pretty rounded. They don't look super angular. But if we look at how it would look with this really blown up, suddenly those same lines look very angular and the densities look sparse. And we see a lot of the travel and things that are covered up by the fact that the scale doesn't really show it. So that's the thing. Even if we're only resizing 15 to 20%, we can make a mass difference to designs that were made at scale. So what do we want to watch for? As always, uh, the longest stitches, The long if they get too long, they're going to be loopy and loose. Uh, the shortest stitches, because the shortest stitches will get too small to run and we're going to end up in the same spot. We're going to end up uh, damaging something, getting thread breaks. We want to look for the smallest gaps. So we're talking about in our O's, our E's, anytime we have borders that are next to each other, uh, the densest detail when we're looking at, at some of those pieces where we had lots of detail in small areas put together, we want to see that and be really careful. So like I said, these are those kind of myths that I want to bust. We can't just have 25% whenever. Um, 5%, 10%, 2%, depending on where you are on these limitations for how these are going. Thread thickness doesn't change. Needle sizes don't change. When we scale things, they don't all regenerate. Fill stitches can regenerate because we add more lines of stitching to an area that's filled. Manual uh, pieces like this where we're doing engraving style shading, pieces where we add detail don't change. Also, the number of passes in this piece Almost every line in this piece has exactly two passes of thread over it. Uh, all of the standard lines that are of the same thickness have two passes of thread over them. When I scale it up, it's still two passes. Can I change that in some places? When we're talking about digitizing, you can imagine as I trace a line across the screen, we talked about this when we're digitizing detail many times. Um, as we go over a stitch once, or a line once, we go to one direction once. If we do two passes, well, at some point, we have to come back across that the other direction. We're back where we started. Um, unless we're going around in circles, we were back where we started. So if we want to go and keep going forward and we don't want to return over that line, then we have to go three passes. If we start trying to add thickness by adding passes, we also have to realize that it changes the sequence of the design and the order in which we stitch it. And it pretty much has to be redrawn in order to really start making fine changes to that stuff. We're digitizing again. Plus, like I said previously, um, when we're talking about this piece, and even though this is a single color piece that's engraving style, I would make different choices about my stitch types. I have a filled stitch here that I'm using for this top. I have a broken stitch, a tatami style filled stitch, uh, creating this roof on this piece. Um, if I went much, much larger, I might do the same up here on the side of this tower, but I'm gonna need more detail. By all means, I'm going to need more of the original lines. I'm going to have to have more curvature. I'm going to have to use shorter stitches in some places, or at the very least, use the same stitches, but more stitch points along a given line or a given curve. Whereas now I'm looking over here and I'm like, man, there's some of this area I probably wouldn't use the stitches that I have. And I definitely would have fewer. The number of stitches that are inside of 
the side of these panels, the little panel lines that are very visible here that just are kind of dark here. I would use fewer of those panel lines in that shading depending on what size I was doing. Whereas I would need more panel lines. I would have chosen to execute more of the lines that were in the piece to get the same kind of coverage and darkness of shade in this larger version, even at this size ratio where we're only talking about a 15%, 20% change. We're still looking at a large enough change that I would have changed how I digitized, would have made different choices to arrive at the same level of coverage and detail. So scale, before we finish up, and I'm going to go ahead and let this be kind of a shorter episode. We're going to do some more interesting stuff later. Uh, certainly we're going to talk about uh, topics that we've brought up in between. We're going to have some interviews, but today we'll go ahead and let this be at a fairly short scale because I don't want to go into another 20, 30 minutes of this. I think we've made our point, right? If we think about embroidery holistically, if we understand that we have these set things we can't change that we need to be very cognizant of, the thickness of thread, the size of the needle, uh, these things don't change. These are uniform dimensions. These are uniform measurements that we know what they're going to be like. We know what density is going to do. We also know that fabric texture can alter things. We know that all of these things have to come together. And we can use other things like toppings and we can use other materials to help us get through this. Or we can digitize in such a way, like I said, by putting a fill underneath something or a uh, knockdown stitch or a bi-directional fill of some kind, or by using support stitching or underlay, we can use things to mitigate fabric textures, to establish a foundation for small stitches. But these are things that we have to make choices about. These are all made through understanding the dimension of what we're working on, the size of the art itself, um, the size of the desired design, of course, as it's finished, and thickness of thread, size of the needle, the grain of the material. Frankly, you're going to find that a lot of this gets pretty standardized because most of the time you're on similar garments. You're either on a nice smooth shirt or you're on a shirt that's a little knit and has some texture and you know about where those run. And you'll know about how big your lettering has to be to be to achieve a nice look on those things. You'll know about how long your stitches should be. So this is not something you're going to be constantly measuring. However, particularly artistic interpretation, particularly when we're talking about deciding how many lines of shading to put in somewhere, deciding how thick uh, a line should be, deciding how much uh, overlap you need on a piece, working at scale, seeing the scale on the millimeter level as we're working is pretty important. So like I said, we just need to understand a little bit more about what we're working on. The importance of scale is this. Scale is more than size. It's more than just uh, kowtowing to a customer who wants a smaller design or a larger design. It's about knowing what that changes about our artistic interpretation, which is something we'll talk about again on another day. Uh, it's about how we change our technical needs, uh, the materials we're going to use, the stitch lengths we're going to use, the widths of satins we're going to use, the type of underlay we might use. Scale is more than the size in that case because a small satin stitch and a wide satin stitch need different things for support. But to also understand that all of this is relative, and especially when we're talking about things like um, resizing, it's incredibly relative to the choices we've already made at the original scale. We want to preserve clarity where there are open areas. We want to get coverage where there should be coverage. And in order to do that, the best thing we can do is to get set up correctly, calibrate for ourselves, and understand those uniform dimensions, the thread, the needle, the fabric texture, and how those relate to the dimensions, the variables that we set on screen. So with that, folks, what I'm going to say is, uh, by all means, if you haven't done it, Stop on your favorite machine. And yes, when I move from machine to machine or monitor to monitor, do you think I don't recalibrate if I digitize a bunch? Yes, I do. Go calibrate. Get yourself set up. I mean, it's going to also help you de defeat the Zoom disease. No matter where you are zoomed in, seeing that grid behind you can help you and make that work for you. And uh, honestly, it just makes things a little bit better. So that's the thing. And, and honestly, we have a couple of questions. I'm going to go ahead and grab a couple quick questions before I say goodbye to you guys. Um, Jerry does have a good question that I'm going to say real quick. Uh, she says, is it better to use a smaller needle for one millimeter satins? Uh, lots of people actually do, even on 40 weight thread, run the 70s, run smaller needles and find that they get a little bit better edge quality. Um, not just for the thinness of the satin, but a little bit of the edge quality. So sometimes you yeah, ask smaller needle. Um, the only thing to re recognize is a smaller needle is going to give you a little bit more tension and a little bit more abrasion on something. Depending on the thread, that may matter. Uh, polyester thread, 40 weight thread, slightly smaller needle is going to be fine. 
Um, do know that if you have thick seams, things like that, uh, thick seams on jackets, uh, constructed hats, thinner needles are going to deflect more and more chance of needle breakage. So you just balance that out for yourself. Working on polo shirts, you're working on dress shirts, and even with 40 weight thread, yes, you can use a slightly smaller needle and get a little bit more uh, fine renderings. Uh, when I say 7511, that's the shop that I ran with. That's what we did at that shop. Uh, it wasn't the only thing we ran, but it was most of what we ran. It's not the only choice. It's not just the best choice ever. It's the choice that was most universal. Worked all right on hats, even constructed ones. Worked pretty good on jackets, even with pretty decent seams, and was fine enough to do the work on most uh, sure, it's especially because I tend to be someone who worries about the art interpretation side. And once again, I'll, I'll just very briefly say this. I tend to try and reinforce the handshake distance to people. Uh, most of the work I did was for companies. It was promotional. People needed to read the letters that were there. I told them if you can't read that at three to five feet, they're probably not achieving the desired uh, result, which is showing someone that name, whatever that text is, letting them know what it is letting them read that from that distance of two people shaking hands, at least American handshakes are right around that three to three to five foot range. And so for me, 75 lend needle did the job most of the time, unless I had some real fine detail to work on. And frankly, when I usually made the switch, a lot of the times that was because I was going to go all the way down to the 68 thread and go real fine. Um, otherwise, usually it was fine. Uh, Doug asks, what point do I usually use? RG for me, that's usually where I'm at transitional point. So it's not quite a sharp. It's definitely not a ball closer, I guess, to the sharp side, but less likely to rip through a bundle of fiber that's existing in the fabric that I'm running on. So RG point for me, most of the time, um, certainly were there a need for sharp sometimes? Yes. Were there a need for full ball? Sometimes yes. Ball point I used less because I didn't do as many knits that uh, got damaged easily. Certainly when I started seeing knits getting holes in them, I'm thinking a little harder on that ballpoint though, right? So ballpoint for knits, because it makes sense to move things out of the way so you don't end up causing a run. Sharps for coarse things, uh, wovens, but I am going to admit, regular dress shirt, something like this work shirt here, uh, RG point's going to hold up just fine. Uh, work shirt, dress shirt's going to be okay. You're starting to do real fine lettering uh, on something. Maybe you got something real coarse, some of the big tote bags we used to do, some of the big jackets we used to do, uh, then we're maybe thinking about sharps, especially as we're going through some heavy coarse bundles of, of fiber that are in that coarse material. Big, thick cotton duck, stuff like that. All right, folks, with that, let's let that be it for the day. Uh, lots going on right now, certainly, but I will be out there posting more as we get going. You guys know I'll be headed off to Dax, Kansas City at the end of the month. So I've got two classes out in Kansas City. I'm going to be doing... Uh, vintage styling so we're going to be doing vintage retro styled stitches so we're doing that so vintage values that's happening and then i'll be doing another piece on detailed digitizing these both uh, hour and 20 so not the big intensive workshop stuff that i often do there just a smaller uh, set so i will be there for that day so you'll see me that day that i'm teaching the 24th uh, really will be the time that i am on the site other than that, I'll be in and back out pretty quickly over at Dax, and you'll have to see me at the next location. But Kansas City uh, will be a pretty quick one. So if you want to see me, I will be there. 24th is when I'm teaching, uh, and I'd be happy to see you guys there. Otherwise, uh, hey, stay tuned here. Stay tuned over at Embrilliance because there's some cool stuff coming down the pipe that I had to, a, a good hand into. And I will see you guys next week. And I can't wait to do this again. Bring your questions bring your experiences, and by all means, bring your curiosity and you're willing to test. Catch you next time.